Hello! This video will contain spoilers for Final Fantasy VII, both the original and remake, as well as Crisis Core, Dirge of Cerberus and Advent Children. One of the best things about Final Fantasy VII is its momentum. You don't wake up in a sleepy village and talk to everyone in town before fighting a pile of leaves with a face. You jump off a train. You're already a top class fighter and you're in the middle of a mission. A terrorist bombing no less. If Final Fantasy VII were a more traditional RPG, it would have begun the story with Cloud in Nibelheim waking up as a young boy. But no, Final Fantasy VII throws you right into the action, and from there, it never really stops. Yes, it cools down a bit, but it's always moving you forward and rarely feels like it's wasting your time. Can you guess where this review is going? One of the earliest development notes for Final Fantasy VII from the director stressed that they wanted a commitment to density over game length, and wanted a story that was relatively quick to finish, but well developed. Final Fantasy VII Remake takes the first five hours of the original and turns it into a 40 hour game. That's probably all I need to say really. Now what I want to talk to you about is these pineapple and coconut cookies I got. Now I like pineapple and coconut so I was curious and oh for god's sake what's this? Sorry everyone, looks like it's my destiny to keep talking about Final Fantasy 7 Remake. I'll start with a quote from the director of the original Final Fantasy 7, Yoshinori Kitase. From the earliest planning stage we had very very detailed designs drawn up. The script was also locked in and our image for the graphics was completely fleshed out. So when we began the actual work, we had already created what you would call storyboards. Of course there was some experimenting as we worked, but we were very clear about what we were supposed to be doing from the outset. During the original game's production, story ideas were welcomed from just about everyone on the team, and somehow these ideas were successfully wrangled into a story which had many branches, but a strong core that kept it all together, and practically no padding. Considering two of the main characters were entirely missable, you could argue that they may have even gone too far in this regard. You could spend hours just exploring or battling, but if you just wanted to focus on the story, you could, without feeling like the game was doing absolutely everything in its power to waste your time. Too often during Final Fantasy VII Remake, it feels as if the game is flicking back and forth between two modes, original and remake, while in original mode it's sticking pretty close to the original story, and when in remake mode it's adding something new. Now Owen, I hear you say, are you just telling us remake has old stuff and new stuff? No no, my point is that the old and the new always feel separate rather than being a comfortable combination of the two. I'm perfectly happy to see new things being added, but more thought should have been put into how they'd affect the storyline. Take Rosh or The Whispers as examples. They will show up and have some screen time and then leave again and we're back on the original track. Rarely will anyone mention or think about these new story additions unless they're on screen at that very moment. And there's that other avalanche that basically do not exist unless they show up. Surely it's a really big deal that there are lots of people with guns in Midgar also fighting Shinra? It's very hard to invest interest in this new stuff when the game itself won't commit to them. In the original, characters didn't need the Turks to be on screen at that very moment to think about them, but in this, Cloud and Aerith being swept out of a room by ghosts is just one of the many events that nobody thinks is worth discussing once they're over. It feels like they're trying to stay true to the original story, but also change it. If you're going to tell it different, tell it different, instead of trying to do both, or else the new stuff will feel like perfunctory asides, or at their worst, filler. What also threatens the momentum of the story is the fact that originally there would usually only be one thing happening at a time. Now there are multiple threads. You can't just simply enjoy the thrust of the main story because running parallel to it now is all kinds of stuff like the fate ghosts, the ghost ghosts, Cloud's flashes of precognition and Sephiroth. You're unlikely to feel swept up by the events of the Reactor 1 bombing mission when you can't even experience it without flashbacks to Nibelheim. 
It takes you out of the moment. You're not fully engaged with, for example, your first meeting with Aerith because Sephiroth is there too. And ghosts. Time for another Katase quote, I think. Throughout the story, I really wanted to depict Sephiroth as an overwhelmingly powerful threat. However, if you have a villain who is an actual opponent who appears before the heroes, then however strong or charismatic you make the character, he will still feel very much life-sized and limited in scope, reduced to another minor evil. That's him talking about his vision for Sephiroth from the original game. Now let's hear from the director of Final Fantasy VII Remake, Tetsuya Nomura. My concept for Sephiroth from the beginning was that everything about him would be cool. Okay. So now Sephiroth shows up for a chat about half an hour into the game, before we've even met Tifa. And this would probably be fine as a nice unexpected moment if he didn't also show up when we meet Aerith. And then again, and again. Sorry, could Square Enix please hire someone to stop Nomura putting spinning motorbikes and things? Because it's shite. I'll do it. I'll take the job. Nomura will be saying, and then the bike will spin and he'll jump off the bike and back on the bike and the bike spins again. And I'll say, no! I promise you that if we don't stop him now, the rocket in Rocket Town is going to be replaced with a big motorbike that's going to spin into Meteor. Two chapters of this game are dedicated to getting into the number five reactor. In the original, you hop off a train and go down a pipe. And look, if you want to add more, that's fine, but please keep it interesting. Turning off multiple lamps to open a door just to get as much as possible out of the assets is not interesting. The game brings up a moral dilemma at this point. Is it right to turn off the lamps, denying the people below light in order to achieve our goal? But the dilemma isn't really a dilemma because we see no consequence for these actions anyway. Besides, the sun seems to be splitting the stones under the plate even though the slums don't have no day or night. Why these poor kids have to draw how they imagine the sky because they've never seen daylight. When is it gonna get dark around here, this guy asks. I'm with you, buddy. If only Shinra would build a big plate that blocked out the sun. I'm roasting here. Is the idea that the sunlight is coming from the lamps and not over there? Because frankly, I'm impressed. That's a damn good wattage. Halfway through this rigmarole, I stopped to think, what am I doing here exactly? I'm turning off the sun in order to open a door to sneak into a reactor? Boy, I wish we'd gone the route Biggs took to get here instead. I also wish we could have had this encounter with Aerith without bzz, flash forward to remind you that she dies. Bzz. I mean, yeah, I know, but I don't need a nudge in the ribs. Can't we just simply enjoy the moment? Okay, never mind. Nice to see Sephiroth again though, huh? Fucking Chadley. I mean, how am I supposed to believe crime even exists in the slums when this boy can stand there with his giant school bag and monocle and not get his head kicked in? He needs to be held upside down by his shoe suspenders and dunked into the big collective slums toilet. Oh, and then he's a robot? So there's just Westworld style fucking robot people now as well. Whatever. Fine. Chuck that in. And and who made Chadley? Hojo? The the guy who uploaded himself to the internet? Sure. Why not? He he did that he did this as well. Hojo probably invented a fucking time machine. Just just look forward to that. What what a busy guy, this Hojo. Cool. Through my research and with your assistance, I have freed myself from Hojo's bondage. Cool. 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 I mentioned momentum before, and one place where you definitely shouldn't lose it is when you hear the Sector 7 pillar is going to be destroyed and 50,000 people are going to die. So you get there as quickly as possible, right? Wrong. It's time for an hour in the sewers and then two hours on a ghost adventure with two ghost bosses. I mean, please make at least one of them an optional boss and let us keep going. 
And Aerith, please stop having a reverie. I'm sorry the ghosts are sad, but there are 50,000 people with pulses that we can keep alive if we get going. I don't want to turn up late and have to explain that we were busy trying to cheer up people who were already dead by fighting a load of bosses. Hang on, is that Marlene? Jesus, please tell me they haven't made Ghost Marlene a boss as well. And when you're finally free of the train graveyard, you're rewarded with more of this shite. Ah, uh, hello, it's the sixth or seventh different type of ghost in Final Fantasy VII. Aerith can't even walk a few feet towards Seventh Heaven without multiple helicopters crashing and exploding directly in her path. How many years do you think it's going to be before we get to fight carry armor? Finally, the plate does indeed collapse. And instead of this great interior shot of the plate coming down outside and the newscaster reacting just before the feed cuts, we get a toy cat in a crown looking upset. I can't help feeling that this is not the time to make people go, oh look who it is, since your focus is meant to be on the enormity of what Shinra has just done. I mean, killing 50,000 innocent people just for profits? Who are these guys? Literally any company? <laughs> but at least Katsith didn't say, Jing's Krivens and help Mobob as everyone died because Oh boy, I am not looking forward to hearing him speaking Scottish, folks. Things are gonna get really nutty really soon. Originally when Aerith got kidnapped, the gang pretty decisively went, okay, let's go rescue her. But in Remake, everyone decides the priority now should be to make sure Sector 7 really definitely was crushed by 150 billion tons of steel and concrete. And... Yeah, it was. But hey, Wedge survived it. And more good news, you find a secret underground lab where Shinra have been storing surplus Moogle medals. You know what this means. Dirge of Cerberus is canon, folks. Weiss the Immaculate should be around here somewhere being really interesting. You spend so much time not rescuing Aerith that she ends up having to astral project herself into Cloud's dream where he's a giant just to say, Still here, by the way. Don't worry though, I mean, at least you know where I am. No rush. And that makes you feel bad, so now we absolutely should go rescue Aerith. Let's do it. Let's go. Wait. Hang on. These people who hate us need our help. Maybe we should hang around a bit? At this point, I began begging the game to just let me get on with it before this swinging bar turns out to be a boss. Barrett is angry because people are saying Avalanche are being funded by Wu-Tai, but that's not true. And this is a kind of interesting idea, but it's somewhat undone by the fact that there is that other Avalanche that have disappeared from the plot for the moment and who apparently are funded by Wu-Tai? Maybe? I... Look, it, it doesn't matter. Fuck these side missions. Oh, the children are missing. Too bad. We're going to save Air... Hang on. No, sorry, we're actually going back to the sewers. <sighs> and you know, up until this second round in the sewers, I did find myself doing little internal justifications for a lot of the things I didn't like about the remake. But a lot of my goodwill evaporated here. The padding was indeed padding, because there was no way anyone was adding a second trip to the sewers because they believed that's what players would find fun, or because it would tell the story better. We should be climbing up to the plate, but instead we're chasing a pig through the sewers to get a key for a guy to open a door to a boss that we've already fought so he can tell me his backstory and that he knows a shortcut before giving me some grappling hooks because this is what value for money looks like, folks. I honestly missed Rosh at this point. What wouldn't I give to see a motorbike spinning through these sewers? And if the second sewers adventure lowered my morale, it had completely flatlined during the trials of Hojo. By now I was just on autopilot and simply wanted to be done. At least Red 13 is here now, but not playable? Well, I guess that's reasonable. I mean, we are at the end of the game. No, there's hours left to go. <sighs> but look, it doesn't matter. None of this matters. Chadley is a robot. Cool. Now look, this isn't some kind of 
Final Fantasy VII Remake Did Everything Wrong video, there's a bunch of things I like about it, and I do not want to give the impression that I think the original was perfect and could not be improved upon. So let's talk about some positives, starting with changes that I feel were improvements. Marlene being left to run the bar alone in the original is kind of fun, but it really doesn't make any sense. She's four. I don't think Marlene would enjoy going into the rat infested cellar to fetch the kegs or having to deal with the slum drunks once they start getting rowdy. It's also harder to sell the idea of Barrett being a good father when he's expecting his daughter to know how to mix a perfect frozen strawberry daiquiri before she's learned to read. President Shinra showing up at Reactor 5 in person is daft. I'm not a big fan of these projections, but they do work better than Yes, I was standing here waiting for you in the reactor that is going to explode. Goodbye. I also like Wedge breaking his fall from the pillar somewhat by using a grappling hook, as it was kinda hard to believe that he was able to survive that fall long enough to chat afterwards. I mean, who does he think he is? Zack? I, I mean, Cloud? Then again, Reno did just jump off while making his escape, so maybe it's fine. In the original, I never really got much of a sense that life on the plate was all that different to what it was like below. You spent so little time and interacted with so few people up there that it never really had an opportunity to show you the contrast with the slums. And it didn't help that both were always in darkness and usually seen from above, so we never saw that key difference, the sky. Remake does make the difference in plate life and slum life starker, but I must say it does seem a strange choice to have the slums being blindingly bright and only spending time topside at night. But my overall feeling on Midgar as a setting in Remake is, they did it. There were moments when I looked at it and thought, this is beautiful. But more importantly, I thought, I'm there. Visually, it varies in quality, but at its best, I really felt I was in the Midgar of the original, and considering the scope of that location, I know it can't have been easy, so yeah, Midgar pretty good. The plan to crossbreed Red 13 and Aerith did convince you that Hojo was mad and horrible, but it also convinced you that he was an idiot. How on earth would that work, Hojo, and no, I'm not asking to see your commission sketches. It does make more sense that he proposes a soldier crossbreed, but the downside is he confirms the existence of G-type soldiers. What's a G-type soldier? Gact. The G stands for Gact. Hojo wants Aerith to shag Gact. It's all canon, folks. Gact was at Nibble Reactor. No way. He just ate my hair. Anyway, this new scene where Hojo torments Aerith by talking about dissecting her mother does a much better job of showing us that this guy is a fucking monster. Definitely an improvement over putting a woman and a dog in a fish tank and waiting for them to breed somehow. What a creep, huh? I bet Hojo is the kind of guy who would crawl back to the place where he died while Meteor is falling to upload himself to the internet in order to return as Weiss so we confuse with Omega. I hate guys like that. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. I never liked that you climbed up this wreckage and then suddenly appear right at the front door of Shinra HQ, so I do welcome this new area, even if it could have looked better. Speaking of Shinra HQ, I think a great example of a change being for the better is Mare Domino, because it takes something that was present in the original and builds on it in a way that not only fits naturally into the story, but improves it. In the original, Domino helps you because he's bitter about being a figurehead who is stuck in a small room by Shinra. In the remake, they expand on this idea and make him responsible for keeping security off your back while you explore the building. It stays true to the original while adding something new that makes the fact that you can wander about Shinra HQ at relative ease more believable. And Christ knows we definitely needed some justification for how long Tifa spends doing this Crash Bandicoot shite in the main hall. And I like that dying enemies now look like they're returning to the live stream rather than, you know, this red thing. Other small but welcome improvements include the removal of things that shouldn't have been there in the first place, like the Texas sign above and inside 7th Heaven, as well as the Korean barbecue option in Wall Market. 
I assume the whispers got to the restaurant menu just before we got there. Ooh, Korean barbecue is no longer canon. The music is good. Not all of it, but most of it. The compilation games have been plagued by what I can only describe as vague rock for some time now. A genre of music that has the unique property of sounding like nothing. But this soundtrack had a lot of variation, some welcome new tunes and really good reworkings of the originals. I had no interest in the weapon upgrade sphere grid thing, but I did enjoy the combat. My fear was that every single fight was going to be nothing more than repeatedly pressing the swing keyblade button while your teammates throw potions at you. So I was delighted to find that the game encourages you to switch between characters frequently in order to use their unique abilities. And I'm glad that I had to spend time in menus, but still felt I had to make those decisions quickly. It's also a massive relief that the battles begin and end so seamlessly because the game as a whole flows like mud. And if every fight began with a transition into a separate battle screen and ended with a victory pose and some menus, I likely would have lost patience with the battles. And I am so happy to see the more bizarre enemies showing up in this because here's the thing. Turning into a frog or summoning a fat chocobo or using a dolphin to jump up a pylon doesn't make more or less sense than someone flying around with one wing or whatever is happening here, but the difference is tone. Final Fantasy VII had silly stuff in it, which was fun, lighthearted, and cartoonish. Advent Children, Crisis Core, and Dirge of Cerberus, they have silly stuff too, but presented to you in such a dour, po-faced way. Watching Advent Children, you can't imagine things like Hell House or Grangeland Jr. Jr. existing in that world. Oh sure, motorbikes spin and fly through highway tunnels and helicopters, but where's Goblin, you know? Remake not only brings back the other enemy designs, but celebrates them. Now that Remake is out, it'll be easy to take this for granted, but the past 15 years of Final Fantasy VII media really played this kind of stuff down, so I'm very happy that I can be turned into a frog. Nobody in Advent Children was being turned into a frog, and if they were, it would have been a very grey and miserable frog, but it could probably fly. Thankfully, it's not just the unusual enemies bringing back a sense of Final Fantasy VII's lighter side. Remake isn't afraid to be daft, and it was during some of these more offbeat moments that the game came closest to matching the tone of the original Midgar section. But Remake's strongest element has to be the characters. I may not like everything the new story does with them, but credit where it's due, the main cast have been really well realised. Cloud is just the right level of moody boy who's here to get the job done. Cloud is a character who has to go through so many wildly different things that it's really difficult to keep him consistent and believable. But I think they did. I can see this Cloud going through painful trauma, awkward dates, and snowboarding. In no other Final Fantasy VII spin-off media have I felt like I was spending time with the Cloud from the original game, but I did with Remake, and I dare say he's the best thing about it. Aerith was great in the original, but has been pretty boring ever since, falling into a pure maiden role, so pure she might as well have been a bar of dove soap with a smiley face. What a relief it is to have her cheek back. Tifa also got a bad deal in the spin-offs, not really having much to say in Advent Children other than sadly saying, Cloud. But then she cheered up for Dirge of Cerberus and said, Yeah! Tifa's uncertainties about Avalanche's actions are present in the original, but Remake does a good job of making them a bigger part of her character. Though she is a bit fussy about potentially being able to smell men's shites, considering she lives in a giant garbage heap, but then again, Shinra employees do eat a lot of very rich cakes. Tifa and Aerith's friendship was another highlight of the game, and I'm really tempted to say I'd have liked more of it, but I must bear in mind that the last thing this game needed was more of anything. Barrett has probably never been better than he is in Remake. His contribution to Dirge of Cerberus was, yo. yo. But here, he brings so much energy and emotion to every scene he's in. There's so much passion in Barrett for his cause and for his family that he's the one who sells you on the setting and the story. He's the one who convinces you that what's happening has weight, that it matters. 
But unfortunately, Barrett is only one man, and the game itself is conspiring against him. I really like this scene where he torments President Shinra until the fan wiki custodians show up and Barrett dies, only to return to life even faster than fucking Chewie. Incidentally, this is the moment where I felt the last drop of hope left in me evaporate. We now know that we don't need to care about anything that happens, as it might be undone moments later by extras from The Nightmare Before Christmas who have access to a rewind feature, and not even a speech from Barrett is going to make any of this feel important anymore. Sorry, I'm meant to be talking about the game's positives, but I guess that was never going to last. After all, we still have to talk about the ending. In the original game, the gang find themselves at the end of the road. They approach the edge of the highway and look to the horizon. The mysterious Sephiroth is out there somewhere, and behind them, the Shinra Corporation is in pursuit, now ruled over by President Rufus. With the whole world ahead of them, they say goodbye to Midgar. Very nice. But you can't make 150,000 lore theory videos about that, can you? How's a guy supposed to make an ending explained video unless the audience are confused? Not that that seems to really matter to ending explained YouTube. So now Midgar is enveloped in spooky fate goblins and there's a magic portal to face Sephiroth for a not final final battle. A few minutes ago we were fighting guys on motorbikes but now we're floating around in some kind of Kingdom Hearts vortex and Midgar is destroyed and Sephiroth is a god and Cloud can fly and aside from maybe Aerith, nobody knows what's even happening here. Because over the past 40 hours, the writers didn't manage to squeeze in a line that would make any of this mean jack shit to anyone. Poor Red 13, he just met us and now Midgar is destroyed and we're fighting a god. He's well within his rights to just say, look, this isn't what I signed up for, I'll catch you later. But I guess he's shown a glimpse of Advent Children and knows he can't let that happen or must let that happen. I don't know, I'm so tired. Eventually things descend into a Smash Brothers style scrap on a floating rock as bits of Midgar rotate around you. Hey, remember when Sector 7 being destroyed was meant to be a big deal? Anyway, Sephiroth throws the Shinra building at you before grabbing the Smash Ball and summoning Meteor. I'm really glad I didn't bother with those side missions where I find kids and chocobos and stuff considering nobody seems to mind that they're all debris now. This is probably the biggest Sephiroth fight there's ever been, and you win. So much for seeing anything as a threat from here on. We haven't even gotten to the Mithril Mine yet. Boy, it's sure going to be scary when Bottomswell shows up, isn't it? At least we know we don't need Mr. Dolphin anymore. Cloud can probably make that jump alone. Maybe we'll skip the Shinra boat entirely and leap from Junin to Costa del Sol. I suspect that people whose first exposure to Final Fantasy VII was Advent Children and maybe Kingdom Hearts are looking at this stuff and thinking that's fine or even that this is what Final Fantasy VII is meant to be like, but a bunch of characters who don't know what's happening, floating around and fighting a baddie we have no reason to care about other than he is on the cover of the Steelbook edition is not good. This simple battle during Cloud's flashback did a better job of showing you Sephiroth is out of your league than having him appear as a time-traveling god did. On a first time playthrough, it's highly unlikely that you'll be able to take on a Midgar Zolum, but we see Sephiroth has eviscerated one. It's simple, but effective. How is this meant to work now? We've taken on Sephiroth with only half the team and beat him. He became a god and destroyed Midgar, and we sent him packing. We're not going to be intimidated because he killed a snake. My fear now is that we're going to have to play the game of meaningless escalation where Sephiroth returns, but stronger every time. Oh no, he's drank the Super Sephiroth potion and he's fused with Sephiroth from the past and future and then Sephiroth went to the past and took out an insurance policy on a Benora white apple farm before it was destroyed and now he's a gillionaire and he's used the money to buy Darth Maul's cyborg legs. If the Sephiroth battle is this big now, then my mind melts trying to imagine what the final, final boss fight of this story is going to be. It'll probably take days to finish. In the original, we eventually come to learn that Cloud is not quite who he said he was. Cloud has been more or less role-playing as Zack, and doing quite a good job of it too. He even managed to fall into the same church roof as Zack did. 
and next to the same girl, funnily enough. Odd that she never mentioned that. Anyway, Cloud never became a soldier first class, which is what he's been priding himself on from the beginning. When Cloud begins to realize the truth, he suffers an identity crisis. He feels he's a nobody, no better than the reunion clones. It was only because Tifa helped him piece together the truth of his past that he could believe in himself again. Now how in the hell is Cloud supposed to worry about being a nobody when he's the subject of Sephiroth's obsession and is now someone who has already defeated Sephiroth and vows to do it over and over again? Cloud's journey of believing himself to be a hotshot ex-soldier to a nobody before regaining a sense of self-worth and becoming a hero in his own right instead of living in the shadow of one makes no sense if he's already saved the world before he's even left Midgar. Of course, this might all change now. I assume it will have to since it doesn't make sense anymore, but the pillar of what made Cloud interesting has been taken out. They've taken out Cloud's arc. Can they give Cloud a new story? Sure, but it's incredible to me that they feel that they can take out the thing that makes him act the way he does and just put in something else. So now it's either leave it as it is and have it not really make sense, or change it, giving Cloud a whole new reason to be the way he is. Or just throw time travel and fate cloak things at the game so hard that it just blindsides the player into accepting that somehow both the old and the new canon are true at the same time, and that's probably what's going to happen. Why am I being so cynical? Because we've already been through this in Advent Children. Cloud spent that film moping about not being able to save anyone while also flying through a plasma ball and slicing a giant monster in half. Speaking of great writing, Zack is now alive. And Biggs, I guess? Hey Whispers, you missed a spot. I suppose now that there's no threat anymore, they felt they needed some mysteries to be the hook instead. And if I've learned anything from the Abrams Lindelof creative writing course for kids aged 8 to 80, it's that all you need for a great story is questions. Do your characters know what's going on? No. Does the player know what's going on? No. But are they seeing things that they recognize? Yes, well, then you've done more than enough. Take a bow and a big check. Why, why was there a Marlene ghost? I... I don't know, maybe I should start moving towards some sort of conclusion. The cruelty of Final Fantasy VII Remake is that under all the bloat, beneath the tedium and somewhere between the bewildering story editions, I feel like they actually did it. There's a pretty excellent adaption of the Midgar section of Final Fantasy VII here, but it's lost in something much bigger. Remake at its best reminded me just how much I love the story of Final Fantasy VII, and its world, and these characters, and I do love them. Final Fantasy VII is a game that is special to so many people that it's hard to talk about it in a personal way because once you begin to wax lyrical about it, there are literally millions of people out there who tune out because, yeah, we know, we felt the same way. But by god, I can't stress just how mind-blowing it was for me to go from playing Alien Storm to this. I never imagined a video game could be on a scale like this. I never thought I would shed a tear for a character who dies in a video game. They're video game characters, dying is what they do. It was absolutely incredible and I loved it. With each new addition to the Final Fantasy VII family, I felt less invested. Final Fantasy VII didn't seem to be a thing that I cared about anymore, but Remake relit that flame inside me. How cruel it is that it also snuffed it out. And I want to stress again that I'm not precious about the original, and I'm happy to see things change so long as they're good changes, and not simply there to make it longer or to introduce characters who ultimately bring nothing to the table. In fact, Remake seems to be in the hands of people who are far less willing to let go of the past than I am, because efforts are made to include all the Final Fantasy VII media they could, rather than allowing the series' weaker elements to fade away. Crisis Core is canon now, so Gact was at Nibble Reactor, and there is a goddess named Minerva who is… something? The two avalanches mean before Crisis is canon now too, so 
The Turks were also at Nibelheim that time. Man, the Nibelheim tourist board are killing it. Red 13 has a girlfriend called Dene. G soldiers ate Zack's hair. Jade weapon. Lazard du Syracus. Laws. Korean barbecue. Tiny katsu. Nuge. The Panasonic Foma P900 IV. Azul the Cerulean. This poster that says Bolt. Kids just love Bolt. I've come to accept that what Final Fantasy VII is now isn't just this. It's this. And Remake reflects that. Personally, I was never clamoring for a remake of Final Fantasy VII, and even though I have a lot of complaints about it, I have to concede this got a lot more right than I ever imagined a remake would, so I can't claim to be particularly burned by this release, but I do feel bad for the people who did want an actual Final Fantasy VII remake, because they're still waiting. This is a sequel that makes little sense as it is, but far less without the context of what came before. It's a follow-up to several games and a film. Rather than a fresh new beginning, it drags the weight of the past along with it. And look, maybe you like all this stuff, and I'd love to say that's fine, but I want to remind you that that means you're okay with the ending of the Final Fantasy VII story being Vincent Valentine meeting a 19-year-old whose body stopped growing at 9 years of age and who absorbs the consciousness of his old love, Lucrezia, which is the most roundabout possible way to try justify Vincent Valentine having a 9-year-old girlfriend, but it's totally fine guys, she's actually 19 and the memories of my ex are in there somewhere so she loves me back, it's, it's cool honestly, there's no need to use your Panasonic Foma P900 IVs to call the police. Oh, and live action Gact is in a cave and has one wing, that's your ending, that's what you like. But don't worry, they won't make it all canon. They'll pick and choose, some things that happened happened, and other things just didn't. If a character dies, but fans don't want them to die, they can come back. Oh no, Rufus didn't die that time, he was just injured. And actually, he wasn't even injured, he's fine, because you want him to be. How am I meant to care about what happens in a story when a line can be drawn through anything and changed on the fly? Remake was an opportunity to take a story that had already become a mess and wrangle it. Instead, they chose to keep adding to the mess. And the remake team haven't even planned out where all this is going, so after fan feedback they can take out or put back in whatever people want. If only the original had been made this way, we could have gotten Aerith back during disc 2. The future is not yet written, but it really should be. I'll finish with another quote. When a character in a video game dies, no one thinks it's that sad. They're just characters in a game, after all. You can just reset the game and try again, or you can always revive them somehow. I felt that their lives just didn't have much weight. I thought we should try depicting a character who really dies for good, who can't come back. For that death to resonate, it needed to be an important character. So we thought killing off the heroine would allow players to think more deeply about that theme. It wasn't my goal to make people cry with that scene, it was more wanting people to understand what it means to hurt and to feel a sense of loss. And you know who said that? Tetsuya Nomura, when asked about Goofy's death in Kingdom Hearts 2. Look out! No! Come on, wake up! I'm sorry about the ice cream! Goofy? Uh, um, Goofy! This is not happening. It can't be happening. It can't. They'll pay for this. So, sorry about the actual review video. I know you're here for videos about toilet rolls and cereal and stuff, so... I promise it won't happen again and that the next one will be about Will McDonald's How to Be a Pub Genius 2. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and if you didn't, don't worry about it. It never happened. Ooh.